215-573-9752. Julia, can you bring something up from uh, either the forums or the Twitter feed? Yeah, I have a, a question posted by Mark Snyder, one of our fabulous community TAs, and he's posting it on behalf of people in our hopelessly lost thread. So there's a very long and active thread in the discussion forums called Hopelessly Lost, which I think was started by some of the community TAs. And um, that, that's hopelessly lost because of, I mean, Stein is the... It's it's the before Stein. It preceded huh? Stein. Yeah. Th this is hopelessly lost week four is the, is the, <laughs> is the one where she's talking about now. Go ahead, Julie. So this is a very simple question, but it's also yeah. a very complex question. Would yeah. you say a few words about what it means to understand a poem? Woo! Hey, Ron Silliman, how do we under say something about... I'm, I'm actually not teasing about the question. It's from Mark Snyder. Um, yeah. But I'm teasing about Ron's being called upon to answer it. Good luck, Ron. Right. I, you know, I have been working very hard for 50 years trying to uh, come to any kind of simple answer to that question. And I, the only thing I can say is I think that in the best writing, which includes that of the people sitting at the table next to you, Al, uh, as well as Gertrude Stein, you actually have to answer it differently for every work. One of the things about poetry, a good definition of poetry actually, would be it, it is that writing that actually brings its own definition of reading along with it. Wow, that's a great answer. Bob, can I vary the question for you, which is what, would, what does it mean to understand Stein? Uh, um, good luck. Okay, uh, I, if the language feels, if the passage you're reading feels open and you see some things there, and I totally agree with Ron that they're not going to be the same things each time, and if, if they are, then it gets a little bit sad and dead and it's like you're recognizing an intersection you've been to before and oh yes, that's what that is. Um, but um, an image would be uh, of... Uh, a door being open to a, a more complex uh, situation that um, arises from the specifics of the poem. So let me just a slight digression, quick one. Um, Williams says that a poem is a machine made of words, which is a sort of a, sort of a great soundbite and 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 just totally deeply wrong as only Williams can <laughs> be. I love Williams. Um, but uh, just think of a machine that does uh, different things each time, perhaps like a brain, maybe, um, that, that isn't just simply rotating wheels or whatever a machine does. Um, and a, a poem is, is a, a difference-making machine when it's a good poem. And Stein is certainly a, a, an active differ difference-making machine. Put it that way. Okay, great. Rachel, quickly on this. Oh, brother. This is not easy. <laughs> okay. First of all, when you talk about poetry, you're talking about um, whole bunches of things. One would be piles and piles of conventions and traditions which pile up historically so that one knows the past variously. Okay. Granted that Stein is tr attempting to erase that, she can't totally erase the meanings of words. So poetry does something with polysemy and with the sensuousness of language that the what, draws sorry, the what of polysemy. No, the, uh, next word. the sensuousness. Oh, sensuous. okay. The sensuousness of okay, language. I, uh, I thought you had heard of that. Bob. No, I just didn't hear the word you said. That's <laughs> <laughs> it's sorry. A tease Bob it's okay. about I'm usually this. the yeah. deaf one here. Yeah. Uh, n that in enriches um, the the work of the brain, which um, Bob. Uh, my friend Bob Perlman uh, was referring to. And that sensuousness and polysemy, the suggestiveness of language, is organized variously according to, you know, let's say, different rules or the breaking of those rules in the, through, through the history of poetry. So the more you know, the more you know, as I used to say to my students. <laughs> wow. I love ending with <laughs> okay. that. Hi, Andrea. Hi, Al. So you're going through Stein for the second time. Had you done any Stein before last year's course? Um, I think I was familiar with the Roses, Roses, Rose. I think that was That's it. That's it? Yeah. Okay, so tell us about, very briefly, tell us about Stein in the fall of 2012 and now what it feels like to be doing Stein in the fall of 2013. Can you make any distinctions? And we'll ask maybe one of our poets to respond to this comment. Yes. Um, 
Stein was where everything turned around for me in ModPo really? first time. It really was. I was sort of just, you know, kind of going along like it was a regular MOOC, and then we got to Stein, and my world exploded. Oh, and yeah. It was just, you know, language as something other than information giving, um, language as something other than a way to um, describe something, uh, describe an object in its physical form, but mm -hmm. to describe the experience of the object. Yeah. Um, all of that stuff was just so... Uh, mind changing and mind warping, <laughs> and I still, um, I still have, you know, history teaches that history teaches things like that still repeat in my head yeah. on a regular basis, and that doesn't yeah. happen with other poets. Oh, so she great. became this earworm um, for me last year. Yeah. This year, uh, I can get a little bit deeper and and kind of, I I've been focusing a lot on the idea of. Um, deconstructing the noun, I guess, the idea that she has of there is no point once you've named something in doing anything else with that name. Nouns are no Except longer... Except if you want to take a role, she yes, says. Yes, if you want role, exactly. And I, I love that idea, and I think that's such a powerful thing for poetry. So. All right, I'm going to just randomly choose Bob to respond to Andrew's experience. You've taught Stein for many years. Is this, is this gratifying? Okay, um, it's... it's Great. It's very, it's very gratifying. I mean, I, that's what you want. A, yeah. You know, that's why to teach Stein because yeah. she's so uh, fascinating and pleasurable and smart. It, uh, it, it just plain old makes me happy, Andrea, that we, you know, we we become friends. We know each other, and you did Stein through a MOOC, an online course with that tens of thousands of people participating. I mean, if Stein can be done that way, then a lot of other stuff can be done that way. Uh, Ron, you're a big fan of ModPo. You were very excited about what we did last year. Do you want to comment on this whole teaching thing or Andrea's experience or anything like that? I think Andrea is quite right. and I, I think part of it, and this goes not just to Stein but to all poetry, is that it's inescapable reading Gertrude Stein that the supposed uh, information giving element of language is not the only thing going on. Uh, that denotation is simply connotation special case. And in Stein, you know, Stein doesn't get old precisely because Stein never simply lapses into denotation. That's great. Uh, Rachel, I can't resist asking you to come. You've yeah. also taught Stein for many yeah. years. I mean, I, I'm fascinated by the fact that she breaks the contract of legal tender. Um, she butts into the tender. And that is for me, you know, when you get down to the the way that language is used communicatively, uh, that the way that she systematically subverts it is absolutely fascinating. It's also quite frustrating. It, I mean, I'd like to interrupt the love feast for a second just to acknowledge love. Fest. love or feast, I, yes, I guess. I thought of it as kind of a like a holy communion or whatever. Oh, okay, right. uh, the, the, I'd like to interrupt the love feast and um, and just point to s things that we haven't said, which would be what is missing in Stein. I mean, I'm sorry, what is missing in tender buttons? Because the, it, Stein varies considerably. Yeah. And one thing that is actually fascinating that's missing in tender buttons is the pronoun I, which yeah. if you look carefully, there's... If I've done my homework correctly, there's probably just one or two, one of which is, I hope she has her cow, which could be commented on for quite a long time. Well, but we, should, we should comment, well, I think, we we'll need to know. Yeah, the, wait, I mean, just... Hidden meanings. Hit, you know? Speak of hidden... Well, that's what I meant by there's a sort of... I mean, there's subtext. One of the subtexts is an erotic subtext without having a text, and Stein and Alice Toklas were kind of getting together around this. This is like a wedding or a wetting, which has a trousseau and it has a number of um, allusions to uh, couples and uh, sexuality, quite a number actually, but it's not the only meaning and it's interesting, it's sort of like once you say that, you've said a mouthful, it's kind of like when you teach Plath and people say, but didn't she commit suicide and then everything gets read in terms of the suicide. Okay, I don't want everything in Stein to get read in terms of lesbianism or lesbian connections, but it is a very, very important subtext. Mm -hmm. Okay, to return to what's missing from Stein in Tender Buttons, generally speaking, moral judgment is missing. Not totally, but there are very few words that tell you that, that things are 
that you know how to how to think about morality. Mm -hmm. There are also very few nasty words. There's one pus. I'm, but what I mean is it's mostly like nice, if you know what I mean. It's in the realm of the nice. There are very few complicated verbs, mm -hmm. and there and so on. So what? There's a lot of predication, but there are no affirmations. Except there's a plethora of affirmations, so they kind of disappear. You know, they disappear. So what it fascinates me that one has a strong reaction. Um, again, I'm going back to Richard's question, uh, to to something that doesn't affirm the I, the I, the ego I, but is affirming an eye seeing and an ear hearing throughout the whole process, because much poetry that we know and like and respect is very I-based, meaning it's about me, me, me. But Stein seems to be telling you that it's about it, 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 and the it thing is the language. Mm -hmm. Which now, she, yeah, sorry. Now maybe this is too complicated for our 10 minutes of MOOC left, but suddenly when, I mean, I, you know, I, I was saying, yes, yes, that's right, and then at the end of what you were saying, I was thinking, no, 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 that's not right at all. I mean, because I suddenly thought, wait, are you saying there's no I in Stein? You're saying no, there's no saying, ego saying, no, in Stein? You're, no. you're saying that Stein wasn't one of the most um, Stein-affirming... Uh, no, I'm not saying that. <laughs> ...biological well, 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 beings I'm ever? I'm saying there's you know, no I, I... Think I, she, I the, the pronoun I in tender buttons. I'm not no, saying no, that other thing. <laughs> Let me just stipulate that Andrea has to come back for ModPo 2014 in order to deal with all those things that are missing in Stein. And we'll leave that question open. Um, Lily, who do we have on the phone? Uh, we have Janina calling from the Philippines. Janina. Uh, I think she wants to weigh in on readers who are non-native speakers and uh, reading practices for Stein in general. Great. Okay, bring up Janina. Okay. Hello, Janina. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you, Al. Is it Nina, N-I-N-A? Janina. I know, it's, it's Janina, yeah. J -A -N -I -N. Hello. Yes. What, what time is it there? Is it midnight? Yeah, that's right. About oh. one in the morning. Oh, my goodness. You're, you're great for staying with us. Do you have a comment or question about Stein? Right, yeah. I, I think it was uh, discussed earlier um, about the readers who are not speakers of the... Uh, who are not the... Who, who do not have English as their uh, first language. And um, um, I think uh, for me, because uh, reading Stein is actually quite a bit of a struggle for me, it's very difficult to read her yeah. and to actually understand what she means. But I think it's some, in a way, it's a little bit of an advantage um, for someone like me because I tend to reread and reread and reread her. And my question is that, could it be that she actually wrote the things that she wrote in order for us to... Um, read her work uh, different every time uh, that, you know, every time that we read them in, in the same manner that um, we, in the same way that we view uh, paintings, for example, and examine them and, and every time um, we look at that, just one painting in, in speci uh, specifically, but we tend to have different things going on in our mind every time you know, the, we, we look at it. It's always, always different. Thank you. Possible that way. Thank you for the question, Janina. Um, Bob, I'm gonna. I, I assume you heard most of what she said, and I wonder if you could be the one to respond in any way you like. Well, just the one uh, distinction that I want to bring up. I mean, I, I that that I agree that Stein was was a, a total proponent of. Um, the the new of excitement and discovery both in writing and reading and and I think she wanted to participate in the moment of discovery every time she wrote uh, and she hoped that readers would have the same participation um, it's it's I don't think she ever was concerned about her future and that the the work would be in a sort of sh like Shakespeare in, imperishable or the way Joyce thought about um, Ulysses, that he wanted to keep uh, uh, readers busy for the next couple of centuries with right. all the different facts. That right. that seems very distinct from what Stein was doing. She, it's it's all about the excitement of an opening present that she is presenting to. She's enacting for herself and presenting to readers. Julia Block, what do we have? 
So Jennifer Sneed. Jennifer Sneed, really? our Jennifer Sneed, who's in te at Texas Tech. Um, just wondered, did Stein mean to be difficult? Did she did she, did she invite frustration? Does she invite <laughs> our struggling with these texts? I think it's a it's a an important question given that all we've been talking about in terms of her being accessible, democratic, yeah. wanting wanting to yeah. be about the new and the discovery. All right, I'm going to ask Ron and Rachel very briefly to answer that question. Ron, does Jennifer Sneed's question is, did she intend to be difficult? Right. Uh, well, certainly Albert Barnes and Leo Stein thought Gertrude intended to be difficult, but that was not on the level of her literary texts. <laughs> uh, that was, was an inner personal in, uh, in those terms. I think she was clearly intending to operate in a very different relationship to readers and to the literary, quote unquote, yeah. um, than the literary figures who are normative during her, her period. There is just nothing remotely like Edward Arlington Robinson or A.E. Hausman about Gertrude Stein, not to mention Tennyson or some of those characters. Uh, so she clearly is, is doing different things in that regard, and it, it's interesting to think about in those terms. And, and just to slightly include what was being said before, it's interesting to think that she's writing in English. I don't know whether or not any members of her family spoke Yiddish or, or Hebrew. That was less common um during her childhood i think than it is in jewish families today in in those terms but she was also living in a city in which english was not the spoken language over for a half a century so her relationship to english and english's relationship to all these other languages changes certainly in her life good point rachel briefly on this yeah i, just, I want to respond to ron um, i think that there are two things and also to um, the question that was asked, Stein, Stein works with just about any language manipulation that can be postulated in this work. That is, you can say there, there are sound associations, there's definitely translingual puns, not necessarily in the, in the snippets that we've read, but they exist. There's writing from prior writing, but mostly not literary writing, more like nursery rhymes and bromide poetry, like peace porridge hot, that kind of thing. There's tons of slid phonemes. There's homophonic evocations or se seemingly homophonic translations um, across, uh, across languages, French, possibly German. She um, lived in Germany when she was a wee wee child for some reason. I'm not sure what it is. But, but the interesting thing about it is that no, none of these tactics is patterned. That is, you don't learn to uh, expect that every fifth word will be a homophonic translation and the sixth word will be an allusion to a nursery rhyme and so on. That makes it, that makes it a little bit intractable. To answer, or not to answer, but to respect the question that was asked about Jennifer's question. Jennifer's yeah. question a little bit, that's a little bit, um, is she intending, does she want to be difficult, is she playing a game with us, that is the way that, the, the form that that question right. often comes up. Um, she's playing a game with herself, she's an extremely ludic uh, poet in Tender Buttons, she is enjoying the mechanisms of her mind that allow this writing which is somewhat hypnagogic, it happens at night and it's then typed up by Alice. Uh, it's somewhat hypnagogic, but it's not stream of consciousness, uh, which is another matter altogether. Right. She is pleasuring herself, and I mean every implication of that, every linguistic and other implications that you can give to it, she is not playing a game with us. She's not making things hard for us. She's enjoying herself which is pretty amazing. Yeah, it is yeah. pretty amazing. Um, we've got to go to, we're going to wrap up pretty soon. We're going to go to a phone call for a question, final question from there, and then we're going to do some final words here. So, Lily, who do we have on the phone? Uh, well, first I want to apologize. There was a dropped call of someone calling from Sri Lanka, and the, we got disconnected, so I really apologize to that person mm -hmm. who's calling. Uh, but right now we have Carol on the phone from the Bay Area. Carol? Yes. Okay. Hello, Carol. Can you hear me? Yes, I can do very well. Thank you so much for taking my call. Oh, absolutely. So uh, I, I actually had a question about uh, Let Us Describe. 
I really fell in love with that uh, a poem, uh, and um, and I was uh, wondering who is us in Let Us Describe? Is it uh, the universe or us, like all of us? Meaning that we none of us can really describe the pain, uh, you know, whenever an accident occurs or. Yeah. All right. So uh, the the question is about the prose poem in in uh, the Valentine to Sherwood Anderson called "Let Us Describe." And the question uh, from Carol from the Bay Area is, "Who? What is us?" So uh, who's got the horrible mic? Okay, Jason, could you put that mic in front of Dave Poplar, who doesn't know it's coming? Quickly. I don't quickly take any Dave. time away from the panel. That's all right. I want you to just to say who us is quickly. Well, I just think she's talking collectively about us and language. All right, give the mic to Jeremy. Jeremy, who's us? And let us describe. Uh, everybody, all the readers, the poem. Those who are reading the poem. All right, give it to Ray for one more. Ray, who is us? You know my story on let us describe, or maybe you don't remember it from my poem. I do, but, but let's hear it. <laughs> us are the attendees of a lynching party. So you, that that is... Ray's alternative reading to let us describe. Okay. Uh, Karen, you want to try one more and then we'll uh, open it up? I'm going to talk about us. Yeah, let us describe, right. Um, it's, it's everybody in the world because she always talked to everybody. She wrote her autobiography of everybody, so it's everybody. Okay. All right, Julia, settle this. <laughs> and good luck in like 30 seconds responding to Ray's reading as well. That's you, yeah. you, you can either bracket that off for another conversation. Although last year we did talk about it a, a little bit. I'm going to go back to Rachel's point about how we, you don't see I in these poems. And there's a, there's a way in which these poems implicate the reader, as many, many people have said. But there's also something about the spectator. So I, I want to talk with Ray more about his reading of this poem too. The people who are watching the poem come together and, and there's something about us all composing the poem together even though it's here on the page, it's printed out, it's, it's right. made out of ink, right. but it takes shape only when we read it. I'm going to take a shot and then I'm going to invite our th the three poets, two to my right and Ron, to say anything they like as final words about any of this, really words that they want to share with you before we stop talking about Stein for now, so just some thoughts that they have. Um, to me, let us describe, let us is, is, is what we normally, uh, it's a version of what we normally say when we say let's. So it's a kind of, um, it's a somewhat weak us, it, to me, that is to say it, it's, a, it's an, a, an open and opaque us, but it's the, the kind of us you hear in let's when let's is a command. She's basically issuing an invitation. So it, you really don't have much of a choice but to be in that us because she is going to command us to describe things in a different way, uh, in a way that's going to allow the end of that prose poem to be truly tragic. And the accidental quality of the end of that prose poem uh, gets us, imp us implicated in, in the, the fragmentation that happens there at the end of that tragedy. I'm going to ask uh, Rachel, Bob, and Ron in that order to briefly say one more thing as a final word, and then we'll wrap up with a couple of announcements. So uh, are you okay going first? Yep, Rachel? I'm all right. All right. I, I'm going to pull something from Steve McCaffrey and from therefore from Bataille, a, th a theoretician. Uh, McCaffrey talks about, ex as Bataille did, excessive energy that can't be used, what he calls the general economy. And it's as if in this work Stein has tapped into this general human energy discharge, flow, waste, orgasm, sacrifice, which gets a little bit to raise, and dreams. It's not a specific economy of utility, accumulation, or statement. And this is a very challenging statement, which I'm, you know, I'm just sort of laying out. Um, it seems to me, however, that although this is true, Stein is anti-logocentric, which this implies. That is, she doesn't want singular meaning, but she's not really anti-patriarchal. I'll just leave you with that. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much. Bob Perlman, a final word on this? Um, just really maybe a um, very interesting what Rachel said. I'm, I'm thinking about it while I'm also trying to pretend that I'm giving you my final statement here. Um, <laughs> so but, Pearl uh, but no, but, but I want to say about, just to, uh, I guess to bring back 
bring it back to the class. Um, uh, Tender Buttons, I think, is, uh, is a sui generis, one-of-a-kind work in, in general, but in Stein's work, uh, it's really not like the rest of her work in, in many, many ways. Um, and it's uh, uh, this, this breakthrough moment where she, where she breaks away from uh, the earlier giant uh, scientific novel that she was writing, um, and then pretty soon after it, she becomes Gertrude Stein, and I think that there is a kind of memory trace that that haunts her, or certainly it, it burdens her to some extent for the rest of her career. Not that she didn't write decades and decades of great work, but Tender Buttons strikes me as maybe I'm agreeing, Rachel, with a no I here. Getting back to your statement uh, that, that it there's a, a freedom of writing whatever um, that is it's just it's remarkably um, open and rich and her later discussions of tender buttons actually tend to tamp it down and she says oh it's cubist portraiture and I'm not describing what I'm this you know what the, the titles are that strikes me as a kind of a you know bunch of red herrings that, that don't really go very far so I guess just hats off to that breakthrough moment, which is still so exciting to read. Thank you, Bob, very much. Ron Silliman, you get the last, last word before my final announcements. Okay. Um, uh, the mention of Steve McCaffrey, who wrote the introduction to the wonderful uh, Canadian version of uh, Tender... Oh, hold it up again, Ron, so we can see it. Um, there it is. Yeah, there it is. It's available in the Book Thug uh, catalog, BookThug.ca. Um, uh, mentions that um, this book was published by a small press in May of 1914, uh, Claire Marie Press, and remained out of print uh, until the mid-1960s when a facsimile edition was done by Haskell House and then was returned to print by yet another small press by Dick Higgins Something Else Press. So the fugitive uh, nature of this work is in fact actually I think an important part of uh, its heritage. And I, I certainly agree with uh, many of the things both Bob and Rachel said, uh, although I would uh, note that the idea that this work is unlike the rest of Stein's work is sort of the thing I think one tends to say about any given project of Stein's when you start to look at it. It's true of the operas, it's true of making of the Americans, it's true of stanzas and meditation. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of non-repeats amidst all this repetition. Certainly true of the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas. Um, and it's been a pleasure being here from Book Thug Plaza in Western Toronto. Okay, Ron, thank this you. This is a huge treat. I just want to say what we sort of bring in the we bring in the big guns, even though you think of yourselves as just any other reader of, uh, and we'd argue that. But the fact is that when we teach Stein through a MOOC, there's a certain amount of credence we have to build up. Like, are we really doing this? Is this for real? Is this just a total joke? And you're talking so. Uh, so articulately about these issues, partly to reinforce what we've already said and partly to introduce new ideas, it just lends credence to the whole project. So, Rachel Blau Duplessis, let's hear it for Rachel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Really appreciate it. Bob Perlman, Bob Perlman, a longtime colleague and friend. And and Ron Silliman in Toronto, where there's a reading tonight at 8 p.m. Toronto time. Ron, thank you. We love you so much. Ron Silliman. Thank you. thank you all from the Writer's House, and we'll see you at the next webcast, and we will see you in the forums.